Dr. Marsha Angel is a leading physician of contemporary medicine. A graduate of the Boston University School of Medicine, she is currently a senior lecturer in social medicine at Harvard Medical School. She is the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, widely recognized as the world's most prestigious and respected and important medical journal. In part for her medical work, as well as for her other work, she was named by Time Magazine in 1997 as one of the 25 most influential Americans. Every large drug company has recently paid huge fines to settle charges of illegal activities. This year, Pfizer pleaded guilty to charges of fraudulently marketing drugs and was fined $2.3 billion, that's billion with a B, which included the largest criminal fine ever levied against any company. Pfizer's not unique. Most of the big drug companies have been charged with similar kinds of illegal practices. Moreover, several top-selling drugs, such as Vioxx, were promoted widely after they were known to be unsafe. And in some cases, the manufacturers deliberately suppressed information about the risks. Now, what does the pharmaceutical industry say for itself? It presents itself very differently as a public-spirited scientific enterprise. It maintains that its primary purpose is to discover important, innovative drugs and bring them to market, and that it does so at considerable risk. It also maintains that prices must be high to cover its huge research and development, that is R&D, costs. This implies that drug companies spend most of their sales income on R&D and afterwards have only enough left over for modest profits. Is any of that true? Uh, the top 10 American companies consisted of, uh, last year, of Johnson & Johnson was number one, then Pfizer, Abbott, Merck, Wyeth, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Lilly, Sharing Plow, Amgen, and Gilead Sciences. The last two are technically biochemical, I mean uh, biotech companies, but they act very much like the large drug companies. Uh, this may be the most important slide I'm going to show you tonight because it shows you the vital st statistics of these top 10 American drug companies. The first thing to notice is the phenomenal profit margin. Last year, these 10 companies had profits of $49 billion. They had sales of 269, I think that says, but profits of 49 billion, or 18% of their sales income. That compares with less than 1% last year for all of the Fortune 500 companies. 18% versus less than 1%, 0.9%. So this is a phenomenally profitable industry. It's consistently among the top, most profitable industries in the Fortune 500. The Fortune 500 is broken down into 50 separate, around 50 separate industries. And the pharmaceutical industry is almost always number one or two. I think one year it was number three. Last year it was number two. Uh, consistently among the most profitable of the Fortune 500 industries. So how can this be a risky industry if year after year it's number one or two in the country? The next thing to notice is the huge expenditures on marketing and administration. Last year, that amounted to $83 billion, or about a third of their sales income went to marketing and administration. Now, these two things are lumped together 
in the annual reports and the SEC filings. And very few companies will separate those two things out. I'm not sure why they do lump them together, except that either one alone would be so large as to be embarrassing that I think they just kind of squish them together. Um, but uh, there is reason to believe, I won't go through the estimates, but there's reason to believe that last year when the total for marketing administration was $83 billion, $70 billion went to marketing, $13 billion, this is roughly, $13 billion went to administration. Now I'm going to come back to the marketing budget later. And finally, notice this. 41 billion for research and development, or 15% of the sales income. Now, 41 billion is a lot of money, but it's less than half what they spent on marketing and administration, and it's less even than they kept in profits after all of their other expenditures. So when drug companies say that high prices are necessary to cover their high R&D costs, that's not quite true. Their high prices are really necessary to cover their enormous marketing and administrative expenditures and to maintain their obscene profits. Now I'd like to go back to the roughly 70 billion the top 10 American drug companies spent on marketing last year. Where does all that money go? The industry will publicly account for only the amount it spends on sales representatives. They send out about 100,000 sales representatives to haunt your doctor's offices. Uh, <clears throat> they'll account for that and for direct-to-consumer advertising and for the advertising in medical journals. But that's only a tiny part of the total. And this is the total that they uh, disclose in their SEC filings and their annual reports. These three functions, these three activities, are a small part of it. In fact, they could have cost the top 10 companies, these three activities, no more than $15 billion last year. That's, that's an estimate. No more. That left $55 billion unaccounted for. $55 billion totally unaccounted for. This is a lot of money to leave lying around without a word about what it's for. It is the elephant in the living room. So where does that money go? Well, we can make some guesses. And here's sort of a list of guesses. We know that the pharmaceutical industry has the largest lobby in Washington. They give generously to political campaigns. So on the left here, we can see that, uh, oh, there it works again, uh, that that's probably a part that comes out of their marketing budget, political contributions, front groups patient advocacy groups, uh, political policy groups. They set up a lot of what, what's called astroturf groups. Uh, these, are, these are groups that are supposed to look like grassroots organizations, but they're really front groups for the industry. Uh, they uh, give gifts to institutions and community and cultural organizations. If you look at the donors to Harvard Medical School, for example, in the Dean's Report of Gifts to Harvard Medical School, you find right up in the top few donors some of the major pharmaceutical companies. But that's a lot of money, but it's not $55 billion. Where does the $55 billion go? Well, I think it goes mainly here, into the education of doctors. Drug companies pay for most continuing medical education, which doctors have to get in order to uh, keep their licenses, their state licenses. They pay for most of that. They sponsor most of the big professional societies. They subsidize their meetings. They pay for other medical conferences, educational materials, gifts, meals, junkets. No doctor has to pay for any of his own meals if he doesn't want to. Uh, in fact, everywhere two doctors are gathered together, so too 
is the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> this is a lot of money. Well, why? Why all this largesse to doctors? It's simple. They write the prescriptions. Prescription drugs require prescriptions. And they do the clinical research. They write the papers and textbooks. They teach the medical students. They provide the continuing medical education. It is important to win the hearts and minds of the physicians. The medical profession has largely abdicated its responsibility to educate its own, to educate doctors about the use of prescription drugs. And they've ab abdicated that responsibility to companies with a clear conflict of interest. In fact, the companies know it's marketing, not education. If you look at those annual reports, they don't have an education budget. It's marketing, and that's what it is. It's self-evidently absurd to look to a company for unbiased, impartial information about a product it sells. And we know that in other walks of our life. Uh, if we want to know whether to buy a Toyota or a Honda, we don't ask the Honda dealer. We know better than that. And yet doctors will pretend uh, that a drug company can provide education about the products it sells. Also, it's useful in this regard to follow the money. If you want education, if you want to take tennis lessons or French lessons, does the teacher pay you? No, you pay the teacher. But here, the drug companies are paying doctors for this ostensible education that they're providing. And that tells you the real nature of the transaction. They are buying access to the medical profession and they are buying their hearts and minds. Now, some doctors believe that drug companies don't influence them, but they do. There's been plenty of research showing that. They influence them not only in terms of uh, clinical practice, but in terms of research and education as well. So this has real consequences. First, take as few drugs as possible. Uh, Many Americans are now the victims of what's called polypharmacy, which means taking many drugs at once. And this is particularly true of senior citizens. Some senior citizens take five, six, seven drugs every single day. These drugs have not been tested uh, with each other. Clinical trials, which are sponsored by the industry and often designed by the industry, usually test drugs in young people because they're less likely to experience side effects, and they're tested in young people who are taking no other drugs and have no other conditions. So when an older person takes five or six or seven drugs, that, that person is really taking a certain risk. We don't know how they all act together in an older person. So as few drugs as possible. Second, avoid new drugs. New drugs, as I said, are seldom tested in older people or in conjunction with other drugs, and they haven't been on the market long enough to see the side effects. When a drug is approved, uh, the, the data on effectiveness are usually reasonably good. They come out of clinical trials. The data on safety are less good because it takes a larger population uh, and, and a more uh, typical population to see uh, signals of, of danger. So my own, uh, my own practice is never to take a drug that has been on the market for less than three years, never. Uh, and I like five years even better. When I say never, that's probably too strong a statement. I mean, I can imagine a new antibiotic coming in, and it is the only antibiotic that kills this particular lethal organism. So yes, I would take that. The risk would be worth it. Uh, but in general, uh, I have a sort of three-year cutoff. 
Uh, three, you should remember the importance of lifestyle changes. They are often effective and usually safe. Uh, not many studies, because they are sponsored by the industry, actually compare drugs head-to-head -head with lifestyle changes. But there have been a few, uh, mainly dealing with type 2 diabetes and the prevention of type 2 diabetes. And when they compare exercise and diet with drugs, the exercise and diet blows away the drugs, much more effective. So in certain ways, this is, this is the place to go. Um, four, ignore every single drug ad, ad you see. Push the mute button. Uh, just don't look at those things. Don't ask your doctor whether Nexium is right for you. <laughs> Uh, five, beware of internet information. Now, there's some wonderful information on, on the internet, but there's a lot of very bad information, and there's a, a lot of information that is sponsored by the industry. Uh, so you have to be very careful about it. Know your source. And finally, um, I decided I would do this. Um, let me go back again. Uh, give you a good source. Well, there are a couple of good sources, but one of the best sources out there is a book that's put out every, updated and put out every couple of years by Public Citizens Health Research Group, and it's called Worst Pills, Best Pills. You can go to the web, uh, it's, and I have, I, I get nothing from this, uh, you can go to citizen.org or Public Citizen, go to their health research group, you will see ads for this book. It's a big book. It's really good. Uh, Worst Pills, Best Pills, A Consumer's Guide to Avoiding Drug-Induced Death or Illness. Consumer Reports also has been doing some good work on this in conjunction with the Oregon Health Science University. Uh, they have now been looking at families of Me Too drugs. Um, the cholesterol-lowering drugs, the antidepressants, and they'll give you a little table of the relative costs and certain data, what is known about how they compare uh, with, with one another. So that's another place that you might go. Uh, and this is my advertising right here. Uh, that's my book. Uh, I'm going to end now, and I'd be happy to take your questions and comments. And thank you for your attention.